Good morning, Passion Church. Well, I'm Pastor Guy, and uh, I'm believing for something big to happen today in your life. I believe you're in the right place. Yeah, go on and give the Lord a hand clap. You might as well. You might as well turn your inspector switch on right now. <laughs> you just better get ready, 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 because the Word of God is about to go forth. And that word of God will change you. It'll transform you. It'll lead you into fertile places, man. It'll just, ugh. Look what the Lord has done. Look at your life now. Look where you used to be. Come on now, somebody. Give the Lord some praise in this place. If he's taking you this far so far, where's he going to take you next? Can you, can you even begin to imagine? It's not even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? Well, give him some praise in the house today. Woo! Get ready, get ready, get ready. Lord, I just thank you. We ain't even prayed yet and we're already preaching good. <laughs> Somebody said I'm preaching good. I'm just telling the truth. I ain't even preaching yet. Hallelujah. I'm excited, God. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's going to set us free from all those things holding us down like magnets to this earth. We're going to soar on wings as eagles. We're rising up. This is a new day. This is a new hour. This is our time. We have prayed about where we are right now. Our banners declare where you are sending us. And we're going. We're saying, here I am, Lord, send me. And therefore, we open our ears to hear what you would say today. And Father, I give you my mouth. May it be a pen of a ready writer. May it be speaking the oracles of God. May it might not be with the enticing words of man's wisdom. But in power and demonstration of the Spirit. Lord, there's, there's something we need more than some good preaching. We need your power. We need your presence. And we need some people to experience it. And let it change their lives today. We thank you for everything in advance. Right now, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you got to turn that. I always say inspector switch. No, we're no inspectors in here. We're expectors. If you hadn't been going to a life group, you're one of the few. Because I think, I think just about everybody in here is attending a life group. Woo! Woo! And they have been fantastic. The attendance so far, the reports that we're getting of lives changed. We got people who've never spoken public leading life groups and stuff. It's just people coming out of their shell. What's happening is right back there on the wall. People are knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, and beginning to make a difference with what they've been given. Man, I think I'm too excited. I need to slow down. I might preach from up here today. Woo! No. Thank you, buddy. Somebody thinks I'm preaching good. That makes me feel good. <clears throat> How many of y'all remember the rich young ruler? He came to Jesus saying, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And Jesus threw out, out some commandments and he said, well, I've done all that. Now, you know he ain't done all that. None of us were able to keep the commandments. But Jesus said, you know, okay, so you want to go deeper. I tell you what you do. Sell all you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. He's saying, get everything out of the way that keeps you from following me. Just come along with me. And the guy said, I don't know. Now I'm rich. I'm young. I'm a ruler. I'm good, Jesus. I think that's, that's enough for me. But I want you to know there's more than being rich. There's more than being young, which I wish I was a little younger, <laughs> which I was a little richer too. But hey, <laughs> there's more than being powerful. Jesus, wherever you're at in your life right now, Jesus is saying there's more if you'll put, a, put aside everything and just follow me. Amen. And he was encouraging that young man. I got a life. And I got a life more abundantly that you know not of. Come on, follow me. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 24. First one there, say amen. Look at you Bible scholars. Good night. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. I'm going to read it out of the New International Version. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another. Say spur one another. That phrase caught my attention this week. That's what I'm going to preach on, spurring one another. Look at your neighbor and say, you're about to get spurred. <laughs> because it says, let us consider, let us think about. Let's think about how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Oh, that's what's happening in the life groups. That's why you're so excited right now. You're starting to see that God really is real. He really does have more for your life than just getting by. Well, when we think about spurs, I, I always think about a cowboy, don't you? A cowboy's got his jingling, jangling spurs on. And, now, if he's a good cowboy, he use, uses them gentle on the horse. You know, he's not going to put a big deep cut in the side of his horse. He's not going to be harsh when he spurs his horse, right? He's going to be gentle. What he wants is that horse just to Get up. Get up. Let's move along. That's how you spur somebody to get, get up. Get along. Now, in the Bible, Christians aren't referred to as horses very often. They're more referred to as sheep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're given a shepherd with a staff, and the staff is sort of like what spurs them. Giddy up, get along. Do you know a sheep, let's just be honest, a sheep is so dumb. They will sit there and starve to death if the shepherd doesn't say, come on, let me lead you to some green pastures. They will sit there and thirst to death. That's, we got a lot of people in the church today. They're not reading the Bible for themselves. They're starving to death for the, for the word of God. And nobody's spurring them. Nobody's nudging them along with the staff. Say spur. spur. Today's message is spurred. I looked up that word in the Hebrew. I know I ain't going to pronounce this right. Paroxusmas. Paroxusmas. It means to incite to good. To provoke to good. That's what we're talking about. Consider. Let's consider today. Let's. Let's think about how we can help one another love better. Help one another do good things in their life. Now, I know I've been a little heavy on the spurs lately. Some of you say amen to that. A couple weeks ago, you got on us about how we're treating one another. We talked about the words of our mouth. Last week, you called us mud hounds. Y'all remember that? Mudhound being a Christian that goes back to his old way of life, you know. I don't know about you, all week I've been praying for Big Bob's family. Y'all remember Big Bob? I told all those stories on him, crazy things he did. I kind of felt bad because I only told the, the crazy stuff he did. So let me set the story straight. Big Bob was just a regular guy. He was a nice, likable guy. I mean, he wasn't a terrible fellow. I just told you some grand stories about him. But on our average day, he was very generous. He would always let me hunt on his land. He would cook for people. He would have big dove hunts and invite people from all over and feed them. Just a big jovial, nice, uh, always had a funny laugh. <laughs> laugh like that. When it come down to it, he was just a work in progress. Just like me and you. Now, I told all of them stories, and I kind of felt bad about it. I said, should I tell all these stories? But you know what? My dad and all his friends, they used to tell them same stories about Big Bob right in front of his face. And he just, <laughs> he loved it. He thought, hey, that's who I am. I'm crazy. You know, he, he owned his craziness. And I was thinking today, <clears throat> What if somebody would have spurred him on to be that big and that 
boisterous to do good works instead of crazy things. See, he was just being spurred on by his friends to do the wrong things. Does that make sense? But he's like us. Just a work in progress. So my message is God wants us to, he wants to use us to spur others to love and good works. And I think that's why the life groups are so successful. Not to, not to spur people to disparagement and discourage. I didn't say anything about that. Not picking out their faults and criticizing. But encourage and be inspired. That's what God's talking about. Galatians 6 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, that means the family of God, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. How do we do it? Now, listen now, we've got to do it gently and humbly. Because it says, be careful lest you fall into the same temptation yourself. You might be trying to correct somebody. And you all high and mighty today and you fell in the same pit next week. So we got to show some humility. We're never called to be each other's judge. So before I even tell you how we're going to spur one another to love and good deeds, we're going to tell you what not to do. You're not a fruit inspector. You're not the Holy Ghost. You're here to encourage, not judge. You're not somebody's parole officer. <laughs> right? You're not their executioner. That's not a role in the body of Christ. Criticizer is not a role in the body of Christ either. Jesus said it like this. Get that big old beam out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to help somebody else get the speck out of their eye. So when we spur, we got to spur with the right motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are, are, we, are we really encouraging or are we criticizing? Are we doing it in a, in a way that shows humility? First off, are we hearing from the Holy Spirit? Because it might be just time for you just to let somebody else encourage you. And are we walking in love? When it's time to speak into someone else's life. Because that's the main thing, isn't it? Walking in love. I think if we get the walking in love thing, we got everything else down. I mean, if we walked in love, it would cover all the other commandments. So make sure what you're doing is out of a heart of love. Because unless you earn the right to speak into somebody's life and you spur them, they just going to buck. You put a stranger on somebody's horse and start hitting them with a spur... They go. They're going to throw you. But if you want to really help people, walk in love. Get to, love them enough to get to know them before you begin to speak into their lives. Is that, is, am, I, am I helping anybody so far? I'm talking about the kind of church I want to go to. Is that the kind of church you want to go to? Because I know a lot of churches are probably out there to just pick one another apart. And I don't really, I'm, I ain't interested in going there. And I don't think the lost people are either. I'm talking about a culture, a culture of warm, fun-loving family that's eager to reach out with God's love. Everyone matters. Amen? Amen? Well, spurring others is usually easier for us than being spurred. <laughs> right? Well, it's easy for us to wear those rose-colored glasses and say, well, I'm going to spur everybody else. But somebody says something to you, it's like, you bucking. You don't tell me nothing. I got it all together. I'm the spurry. You know? <laughs> but there's huge consequences for dragging our feet on the sanctification process. So I think a little spurring has to occur. Because like I said, sheep will just sit there. They won't eat. They won't drink. They won't do the things that lead them to where God's calling them without a little nudge. Time keeps on ticking. Our window of 
of influence in our children's life is passing us by. Those of you who have smaller children. You get only so many years to speak into their life and pretty soon they're 12 years old and they know everything and they're not listening anymore. I'm not saying that's the hard fast rule, but that's common. And unless you've developed a relationship of love with them, you're not going to be able to speak into their life much more after that. And your, your calling is passing you by. Do you just want to stay where you're at? No, you don't. Every one of you wants to hear, well done, good, faithful servant. Every one of you wants to do great things. But a sheep's tendency is to remain still until some other object causes them to get into motion. Isn't that somewhere in school? In the class that I learned, teacher, do you remember that? An object tends to stay at rest until another object exerts force on it of some sort. <clears throat> huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? Sheep are a little wonky, yeah. That's the word, that was my word for the day one, last week, wonky. But anyway, we walk in grace or we sit and insult it. Which one do you choose? Do I need to say that again? There's no neutral in Christianity. You either walk in the grace or you just sit and insult the grace of God. My advice is for us to be meek. Meekness. What does the Bible say? Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. What did he mean? Did he mean, does it mean weak? No, meekness is strength under control. That means there's power. There's power in your life. But you control it and harness it to do good things. You're not like Big Bob that just uses his strength and his bigness and the, to, to do bad things. Meekness comes from, meek comes from a term that they used to do to horses, wild stallions. You know, you got to break a horse before it can be used. A, a wild stallion's fun to look at, but it ain't going to plow your field. It ain't going to get you to town. It ain't going to pull a wagon. It ain't going to accomplish anything until you put that bit in his mouth and teach it to obey the master. And so God wants you to be strong, but he just wants to, you to be strong in the way that he's pulling the reins. And, and he's going to gently spur you to have success. Hebrews 12, 11 says no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. In today's message, we could say no spurring is enjoyable while it's happening. If somebody, part of spurring someone on is often adding correction to their life. Saying, hey, brother, I know you can do better than that. You know, what you're doing right now is sin. What you're doing right now is, is not accomplishing anything. But hearing that is not enjoyable while it's happening. Because we have this thing called pride. It's painful. But afterwards. There will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. You see, the peace comes after you get moving. The peace comes after you've accomplished all you were supposed to accomplish for that day. Proverbs 12.1 says to learn, you must love discipline. I love to go to, a, to hear a sermon where the, the pastor's stepping all on my toes. I want to be challenged. I want to be spurred to, to get off of of the pew, so to speak. I want correction if there's something I'm doing wrong. I want somebody to speak those things into my life. Don't you? Because it goes on to say, it's stupid to hate correction. We'll just leave that right there. You see, I used to hate correction. Before I knew Jesus. Couldn't tell me nothing. About nothing. I was arrogant. I was prideful. I was self-seeking. But then I got saved. And I was a little less arrogant. <laughs> a little less prideful. And a little less self-seeking. But hopefully more so now than I was then. Hopefully I'm moving in the right direction. 
And I'm so thankful that God didn't let me settle. And I know you are too. God loves us too much to let us just sit there and starve to death. To just go on day after day with no change. Same old self. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Who is love? God is. The whole chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, is is talking about the character of God if you haven't realized that. And love suffers long and is kind. And I know he has suffered long with me. I know he, he must be wanting to pull his hair out sometimes the way I behave. I know he's thinking, I, he knows better than that. But there he goes again. But you know what? He didn't call down fire from heaven on me. He's long-suffering. Aren't you glad God is long-suffering? Anybody who admit that I need a long-suffering God, a patient God, one who's willing to wait on me. He waited 32 years before I even got saved, and he didn't bite his fingernails once. He was waiting on me, nudging the whole time. (laughs) Jesus' spurs are gentle, yet firm. I remember the story in John chapter 4 about the woman at the well. Jesus was traveling, and, and the disciples said, we're going to go into that town and get some food. Come on, Jesus. And for some reason, Jesus didn't want to go. He said, I'm going to sit here at Jacob's well. I think he knew what he was doing. I think he'd probably come a long way to have this conversation with the woman at the well. He'd probably, probably knew every divorce she got every bit of trouble she's been in, like he knows about us. Anyway, he begins to talk to her, and she's so feisty. Man, she's just smart aleckly. You know what I'm saying? She's got a comeback for everything he says. What did Jesus do? Well, fine. I was going to try to help you, but I'm out of here. Has Jesus ever done that to you? And you know you deserve it. (laughs) You know we deserve it. Jesus didn't. He kept talking to her, kept encouraging her. And then finally she was, she was getting off track, and he said, he said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. Then he confronted her with the reality of her life. A little harsh, wasn't it? We might consider that harsh. Sometimes the truth comes off as a little harsh. But you know what? There must have been love in his words up until that point. Because she received it. He said, I, she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. The Messiah, when he comes, he's going to tell us all things. And she, he said, I am he. I am the Messiah. About that time, the other disciples came back. They were wondering, why is he talking to that woman? She dropped her water jug. Everything that that she was planning on doing that day, she just, not important anymore. I've talked to the Messiah. (laughs) I've talked to God. All my plans don't mean nothing now that I've talked to God. And one glimpse into his glory will change your life. One word from God will change your whole course of your life if you'll let him speak to you. And she took off towards town. And she began to tell everybody in the town, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. She began to preach Jesus to the whole town. Here this woman probably had the worst reputation in all the town. She didn't care. She began to preach it. It says many people in the town got saved, believed in Jesus because of her words. There was something changed about this woman. And then it says, then they came out to see Jesus for themselves, and he stayed there two more days preaching to them. And then they said to her, we believed at first because of your word, but now we believe because we've heard for ourselves. We've seen him ourselves. And see, that's what Spurring does. 
At first, you may be spurring people to know Jesus, and they might, yeah, I kind of know him. I kind of, kind of got a relationship with. Him. I know he's the Messiah. You got these little quick comebacks, these witty comebacks for everybody. But you keep spurring. Pretty soon, they'll be coming back to you, saying, "I got a relationship myself now," and that's what we want people to have, isn't it? To have their own relationship with Jesus, not because of your word. We're leading people to Jesus. I think that's kind of the, the main reason we're still down here after we got saved. Or else he could have just taken us on. It's the Great Commission. Jesus always spurs us to hope. Think about her life and how it must have changed at that point. I mean, here she was. I'm lowly. I'm no good. I got a reputation. I got all these things. And in an instant, it was all wiped away. And she was made new in Christ and with a sense of purpose. Now she's won a whole town to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's many of your testimonies here today. The world would have cast you away a long time ago, and now you're winning people to Christ. You're glorifying Christ in your life. It's amazing the transformation from having a spurred conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he knows more about us than we know about us. You know why? Because he created us. You think you know you. He knows you. And he sees the end from the beginning. And he knows how you're going to be in heaven after you've been perfected. He knows the you that's going to live in eternity. And what he really is trying to do is say, hey, you know what? You can live some of that now. To the degree that you'll let me move you along in our walk together and your sanctification is the degree that you can live heaven on earth. It's better than being rich, young, and a ruler. You can have all the things of this world and lose your soul. What have you gained? He knows you. And he believes the best about you. And that's why he doesn't give up on you. He knows what you're going to be like in heaven when you're perfect. Trust him. See how it, how it does for you. I think about old Peter. You know, Peter had a, a feisty mouth too. I can imagine when he, he must have got into it with one of the other disciples or something. I don't know what happened before that, but he came and he asked Jesus. He said, Jesus, how many times I got to forgive somebody in a day? Seven times? And Jesus probably took a deep breath and said, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, you just keep doing it. I can see Peter's eyes rolling around now. <laughs> Peter, he was something else. He said what was on his mind. But he didn't know just days later that he himself would deny the Lord three times in one afternoon. And that he would need that forgiveness. What did Jesus do? Throw it up in his face? Peter, uh-huh, you, you were talking about you didn't want to forgive nobody. Look who needs it now. Nope. Jesus chased Peter down to the, at the lake. Peter was trying to go back to his old life, thinking it was over. He had messed up so bad. And, and Jesus chased him down and cooked him a meal and asked him three times, Do you love me? To restore him from his sin, where he denied him three times. And three times, you know what he did? He said, Feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Restored his purpose, too. Never once did he say, I told you, Peter, you're going to need forgiveness. You don't need to be at nothing negative. Positive. Positive reinforcement. Positive encouragement. And Jesus is chasing some of us down. We're running from him thinking that we're too far gone. We done made too many mistakes. And we're in the middle of our sin and we can't stop. Let's just be honest. Sin is an, is an infection. 
And though we have the power to overcome sin, many times we don't. And there's something you're battling right now. I've often asked the Lord, take this thing from me, Lord. I besought the Lord thrice. But he said, my grace is sufficient. And if you're fighting something and it's left in your life, you're wondering why God's left it there. It's so that you'll have something to beat up on the devil about. Something to challenge you to get stronger. Something that will make you stay dependent on him. Everything we see, we need to see it through the, through the eyes of Jesus' love for us. And his sovereignty over our lives. His ability to bring us through to the end. Don't give up on yourself, Jesus would say right now. There was a church that pretty much had given up on Jesus. In Revelations chapter 3, we see Jesus talking to the church of Laodicea. He said, you've, you've lost your first love. Your heart's grown lukewarm. That's the thing we need to fear most. Is that our hearts would grow lukewarm towards Jesus because without him we have nothing. Our one thing is to stay close to Jesus. And he's, he's rebuking this church. You've done this. But what does he say in the very next verse? After he rebukes them, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open the door, I'll come in and have supper with you. I'm quick to forgive. I'll restore you like I did Peter. You see his love? Love can often be, I mean, truth can often be harsh. But when it's spoken in love, it can be the most powerful force on the earth. When you nudge somebody, remember these things. Amen? Amen. Guess what? August 8th, we're going to have Zachary Bigley come minister here. How many of y'all remember Zachary? He, he teaches the youth camps that we send our youth to. He, he uh, led a children's camp here for us a couple of years ago. He's just a blessing to us. He's preached here several times. Some of you are thinking, yes, finally some good preaching in the house. <laughs> August 8th, write it down. It's a, it's a big deal. I'm excited about him coming. But you know what he's going to say, right? He always says the same three things. He may he preach a whole different message, but in the end it's going to be God loves you, he's not mad at you, and he has a plan for your life. I've heard him say it over and over and over again. But that's what we need to hear. That's what we need to hear. God loves you. He's not mad at you. Sin was dealt with at the cross when he said it is finished. And God is no longer up there holding our sins against us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I believe. God has a plan for your life. Once you receive your forgiveness, stay forgiven. And walk in the fullness of God's plan for your life. Now, I, I try to say the same thing. God loves you. He's not mad at you and he has a plan for your life. I just don't say it as eloquently as Brother Zach. Sometimes I know, I know. My spurs dig a little too deep. The old football coach in me. I push a little too hard. I know. But I want you to know this. It's only because I'm the one God chose to be your pastor. And it's because I love you. More than Zachary does. <laughs> In fact, I love this church more than anybody else, I guarantee you. It's been my passion since God brought me here. I got saved here. And I'm only a pastor now because I loved it more than anybody else. <laughs> and I, he's still working on my humility. But 
in my defense. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 says, Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Whether you want to or not. Whether they want to hear it or not. Preach the word of God. Amen. It's the word of God that's able to change your soul. Patiently correct. Now that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying I need to work on. I'm not that patient. Patiently correct. Rebuke. And, thank goodness he put the and there. Encourage. That's what I'm hoping to do today. Encourage your people with good teaching. And it's always good teaching talking about Jesus' love for you. So, how does God want to use us? Let's get back to that. How can you be used? How can you spur others towards love and good works? Well, Jeremiah 3.15 says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. Who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. You begin to see yourself as a shepherd. Whether it's just your children to start with. Or maybe it's your life group. Maybe it's a friend that you have at church. But God's going to put his heart in you to do that. If you've got God's heart in you. You have all that you need to make a difference in this world. And you do. The, know you not that the spirit of God dwells within you? The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in your mortal body. And you can help raise other people from the dead. You can say, I was in that tomb, but I came out. And let me tell you how I did it. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. How did he use his disciples in that situation? He said, go roll away the stone. He'll use you. To roll away the stone, the impediments, the, the obstacles that are in somebody's way to receiving the gospel. Receiving, coming out of their, their tomb and coming to life. He'll use you to roll away their stone. And then when Lazarus came forth at the word of Jesus, came alive again, he come out. But he was like, in all these grave clothes, these nasty smelling things, these foul, stingy, ugh, Cloth, because by now he stinketh. <laughs> and he comes out, and what does Jesus have the disciples do? Loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. That's your job. As believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, you got a sister over here that's bound in an area. Loose her and let her go. You got a brother over here walking in the wrong direction. Loose him and let him go. Get him back on track. That's how God wants to use us. You remember the story of the prodigal son? Told it not too long ago. Boy took his dad's inheritance and went off and on, spent all, everything he had on riotous living. Then there was a famine. He had to come back and he was going to grovel before his dad and say how sorry he was. But his dad wrapped him up and loved him. There's that love again. That unbelievable undeniable, un, unfathomable love of Jesus Christ, that he would do that. But he did that. And, and how did the father use the servants, the ones that were in his house? How did they, he use them to restore the son? And how do we restore those who've lost their way and come back to church? He said, hurry. Get the robe. Get the finest robe. And put it on his shoulders. Hurry. Get the ring and put it on his finger. Wash him clean. Wash his feet and put some new sandals on it. Kill the fatted calf. You know what? We're fixing the party. What's your job? When somebody comes in here feeling low down. They had not been to church in six months. And they know they've been in the world. And you say, you know what? You confess your sins, God's faithful and just to forgive you your sins, cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Let's put that robe of righteousness back on your shoulders. Let's get you cleaned up. Let's get you seeing that God still has a, a, a ring, a signet ring of his authority to put in your life so that you can whoop that devil next time. Let's wash each other's feet so we can put you some sandals on and you can get back in your purpose. Get to stepping. That's how we help one another. It's how God uses us to help one another. Hebrews 10.24 says this. 
Let us consider how we may spur one another. How we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of. And, and let me just say this, just out of meanness. Should I say it, Angie? She's like, no, I wouldn't. I don't know what you're going to say, but I wouldn't if you're asking me. Some people have fallen too much in love with the online. That was never meant to be permanent. And it's not an excuse because you, you want to sleep late on Sunday. Encourage, I'm just spurring you. Just spur, give you a little spur. But it says not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit or forming habits of doing. But encouraging one another. All the more as you see that day approaching. I'm encouraging you to get back hooked up with the church. I'm encouraging you to be faithful to God and to your call on your life. You can't serve God from a distance. You can't be part of, you can't be part of the body of Christ from a distance. We need one another. We need this encouragement. We are all part of one another. We are, we're going to do great things together. We are about to take this community... And that's just going to be the start. When, when these banners get fully in motion, look out world. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This is the seed of a mighty oak tree right here. We're planted in good soil. We know what God has said for us to do. And all we had to do is walk in love and follow him and look out world. I'm encouraging you. Stay planted. Like oaks by the living water. Stay planted where your tree will always be fruitful. God has something better. God has always has something better for us. Well, hallelujah. Anybody encouraged today? Did it, was that an encouraging message or... <laughs> Somebody said, I just woke up. What? <laughs> what you say? I told him, turn that microphone up loud today so I can keep some of y'all awake today. No, just... <laughs> Anybody else in here got an encouraging word? Anybody got a testimony, a quick testimony they want to share of how God has spurred you lately? to a new place in your life and how it's radically changing the way you think, the way you live, the way you move, the way you breathe, the way you see life. I would dare to say that you do. I would dare to say that if you've been faithful, that you do. And we need to be thankful for that. We do. We don't need to take that for granted. We wake up and it's a new day and we think we got to be perfect. And by the end of the day, we hadn't been perfect and we beat ourselves up. But no, this is, a, this is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. Your bad days now are way better than your good days back in the day. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. I'm not just preaching. Now I'm telling the truth. You ain't where you used to be. But we ain't where we're going to be when we start pulling together and spurring one another towards love and good deeds and the way God would have us do it. Anybody in here uh, doesn't know Jesus? You said, if I died, I, I hope I would go to heaven. I think I might. I don't know. You can know. He doesn't want you tortured like that. That's the Muslims or somebody else that thinks it's all about good works. Look, the cross... Is done. He's not getting back up on the cross. It was finished. Sin debt was paid. All you got to do is receive the gift of salvation. Are you listening? 
Too many people resisting Christ because they're looking at themselves instead of the cross. The power is in the cross. The power is in the blood of Jesus. It was his life that was given as a ransom for yours. It was his life that redeemed your life. And you, if you die and went to heaven, it, it's not God's fault. He's not sending you there. You chose to go there. You rejected so great of a salvation. You walked through the blood of Jesus like it wasn't nothing. You have to basically crawl over Jesus to get to hell. He's done everything he could possibly do short of, of going beyond your will. and He won't do that. You have to make a decision. So what I'm asking you today, will, will you make the decision? If you don't know Jesus, if you're online today, you're in the building today, simply make a decision. We're called to be believers. The Bible says if you'll confess Jesus as the Lord of your life, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's what he asks. That you believe he is who he says he is and you say it out loud with your mouth as a uh, confirmation. For with the heart, man believes to righteousness. And with the mouth, man confesses unto salvation. It's that simple. And here you are trying to earn it. Come on. We're a bunch of Christians in here on every side of you is a bunch of Christians and, and none of us have earned heaven. If you're in here today thinking you've got to earn it, stop that thinking. That's worldly thinking. Jesus paid your debt. You receive it like you would receive a pardon from the governor to get out of jail. You just receive the pardon written in his blood. And be adopted into the family of God. Pray with me like this. Say, God, I believe. I receive Jesus as my Lord. Because I repent of my sins. I turn from my old life looking unto Jesus. Jesus, be the author and the finisher of my faith. Fill me with your spirit. Lead me to do great things by your power. Let your love be my guiding light. I am yours. I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody give him a hand clap like you mean it. Like you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Woo!